So please join me in welcoming J.K. Semancic. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? So I, I have the coveted right before free food for college students slot, um, right after the cool Nike ad. But I do, as Mike said, we've got a secret weapon, uh, and that's because I've got puppies. Uh, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's a big part of what our day is uh, each and every day. Uh, you know, and, and where, where was the snake? Over here, who, who had the snake? All right, that guy. Uh, that guy's available uh, later, if anybody. Uh, actually, some of the most passionate uh, customers and team members we have uh, are reptiles. We work in a, uh, our, our reptile uh, aficionados, breeders, owners, hobbyists. Uh, what, how they classify themselves lots of different ways, but uh, it, it is part of what makes what we do special. Um, we work in a place where people are almost universally engaged. Um, to be fair, every business has issues, right? Every, uh, being in the middle is one of the least popular places to be these days in the US. Um, but when it comes to pets, we're fairly universal in our love for animals and fairly universal in our love for others who love animals. Uh, and that's part of what makes what we do uh, an awful lot of fun. Uh, the pet industry itself, uh, is almost 70 billion. Um, Kathy, take notes. You probably want to work on some pet things. Uh, for, for 25 years that I've been in retail, this industry has grown. Uh, if you look at how much is spent, was spent in 2017, uh, almost 85 million households. Uh, if you, anybody wonder how that breaks down, uh, most popular pet, anybody know? Dog, cat, no. Fish, thank you, freshwater fish specifically. 130 million plus households with freshwater fish. About nine, between dogs, cats, who wins? Dogs. Okay, I, I personally believe dogs, but actually there are more cats. Uh, there are 90, uh, roughly 94 million cat households in the US, roughly 90 million dog households in the US, and if you're keeping score all the way down to reptile, it's about 15 million households. Now, with only 85 million having pets, that tells you there's an awful lot of people that have a lot of critters running around and just keep expanding their family, right? That's part of why it's continued to grow at the rate that it has. And, and through all of that, one of the names that's really been leading that growth and, and driving that, that trend within customers is our company. Um, for those that don't know about us, um, this is what we look like. Uh, over 1,650 stores still growing, uh, all uh, United States and Canada. Uh, we are the largest provider of pet services in the U.S. So if you think about anything from hotel to grooming, salon, doggy daycare, we will provide services to over 16 million pets a year. Um, not only do we have a large representation of uh, business within our PetSmart stores, uh, but uh, there might have even been a reference to it uh, yesterday. I know somebody asked me about it. Um, Chewy.com. Uh, uh, is the fastest growing and largest e-commerce provider in the space. Uh, if you, depending on what you do or don't believe about market share, uh, is the only rival to Amazon in its space that has similar or higher market share. Uh, and at the point in time, or at least within its category, and at the point in time that we acquired it was the largest e-commerce acquisition uh, in retail. Um, thankfully, uh, we, we don't hold that title solely anymore. Uh, those multiples have continued to grow up, to go, but uh, together uh, we collectively provide uh, the most goods and services to pet parents across the United States, and I have the privilege of being able to work with uh, and, and oversee and serve uh, both of those parts of our organization. Uh, we've got over 55,000 associates, more than 11,000 items in store, and one of the cool things is we also have partnerships with over 900 veterinary locations in our stores. So uh, when, it, when it comes to one-stop shop for all the love and care for your pets that you need, PetSmart is your partner. Um, you heard this yesterday loud and clear. Anybody who is winning in this space, how many times did you hear somebody talk about why they do what they do? You know, some of the common denominators that I've heard as I've listened to speakers talk is they talk a lot about you know, maybe mission, maybe vision, but it all comes down to 
why is it that you're here, and, and why, do, why do you matter? Why do you matter to consumers? Why do you matter as a team? And as I stepped into the company, look, our, our company has gone through a lot over the last several years. Uh, we've dealt with an activist investor. We've dealt with uh, being bought and sold. We've dealt with leadership transitions, taking on an acquisition. And one of the things that, as the new CEO, I recognized was that all that stuff becomes distracting. And our opportunity was actually to refocus on the customer and make sure that we were true uh, to what it was that mattered most to them and most to us. Now, the good news is we're blessed to have a really clean, clear mission. We love pets. We think pets make us better people. Everything that we do is for the betterment of our pet parents and their pets. It's about helping them lead much richer and more fulfilling lives. Whether it's the goods that we sell or the services that we provide, we really don't sell stuff, we sell care. And that's something that impressed me about the PetSmart team. No matter how much any of that other noise got in the way, this was the common denominator. When you heard those 75 people cheer, they do that and are here because of the love that they have for animals. We have 1,600 people on our campus in Phoenix at any given point in time. Anybody want to know how many pets we have on campus? Take a guess. Not quite 1,600, but it's between 1,000 and 1,200, all right? If you're having a bad day, look, it, I'll just say this. It's really hard to have a, a tough conversation with somebody when they're holding a puppy, right? I mean, <laughs> and I've had to do that. I, you know, when, when you're giving somebody, hey, listen, let's talk about accountability in there, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's difficult. Especially when the dog turns to you, I mean, it's, it's, but it's part of what makes us special. And, and to be able to have that connection and know that, look, when we do what we do well, it matters, right? It, it's, it's as clean of a connection to mission and vision that, that I've ever had the opportunity uh, to be associated with, and it's one that's fairly universally appreciated. We had an opportunity to refocus on that. We also had a need once we, we centered on that, I asked our team, hey, what is it that we need to do better? And, and it became very clear that before we could really focus on customer, we had to focus on how do we work well together. Um, every CEO that had come in before had changed the values of the organization, which tells you they were probably not so much about the values of the organization, but more about the values of the individual, right? And I committed the last thing I'm gonna do is actually change the values of the organization because I, that, that's not about any one individual. So we surveyed all of, of our team and uh, the first thing they all told me to the tune of about 94% uh, of our total population, 55,000, they said, well, I don't know what you're gonna do, but I hope you're gonna change the values. So uh, we did. Um, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm, I'm wrong about that. Although I agreed with them. I mean, one of our values before was rigor. Anybody know what rigor means? If you actually look up the definition, it's uh, inflexible to change. <laughs> Probably not the aspiration that you want, uh, particularly today, right? Um, so uh, what we did is we spent time talking about it. Look, we start with a passion for pets and people. That was clear. Accountability was an opportunity for the organization, something that we weren't as good at as we needed to be. And so we thought about what's the right way to articulate that and make sure that we're delivering on our commitments to each other and that we're actually playing the kind of active role in growing the business and leading. Playing to win. You know, I think when you go through a lot of those transitions, you lose sight of what it takes to actually be a leader in your space and to lean forward. Ultimately, learn new tricks. I loved what Marvin talked about this morning. The two words that, that you know, a lot of things stuck, stood out to me, but if you talk to really great merchants and leaders in retail, you'll hear the words intellectual curiosity a lot. That idea that there is always a better way, which is very different than saying things can never be good enough, right? Doesn't matter how good things are. If you're constantly seeking to ask questions and understand, that's something that we wanna make sure our teams are focused on. That's expected of us uh, as leaders in the space. And then ultimately, we serve possibly the most diverse set of customers in the US, right? Um, a lot of retailers do. But no matter what's, what's unique about PetSmart and the customers that we serve, and even our associate base, is no matter how you define diversity, whether it's on ethnicity or age or economics or sexual orientation or et cetera, 
it doesn't matter. Our numbers are fairly ubiquitously distributed. And so to not have that reflected in our values, which it had really not been for some period of time, was a really big miss. Making sure that we understand how to leverage those differences to create something greater than any of, of our own individual positions was something that was really important to our organization. Um, and so um, that's another thing that we brought into. Diversity and inclusion had not been a part of our uh, recent history. Uh, and, and that became a bigger part of our strategy. I'm proud to say today, these are examples of associate resource groups uh, that are focused on a number of uh, diversity initiatives. Um, if you look at our population in the office today, uh, we've got about 1,600 people on campus. Better than 50% of our associates are involved in one or more of these groups. The level of activity and commitment to make sure that we are working well together and calling upon the backgrounds and influences and insights that uh, all these individuals bring to our organization is something that I'm, I'm really excited to see grow within our company. Um, as it relates to customer strategy, it's really pretty simple for us. Uh, you can remember one word, and that's smart. Services are important to what we do. Delivering high quality convenient services is, is critical to our success moving forward. Merchandise is also it's always been critical, but the evolution for merchandise within our organization is really simple. It's not about having breadth of stuff, it's about having the right stuff. People come to us looking for solutions, and we've got to have the kind of expertly selected merchandise assortment that helps connect people to those solutions. The A in SMART is associates. It's our biggest secret weapon. When people walk into our stores, over half of the people who come into our stores are coming just to have something to do with their pets. The joy of being able to find the right toy or the right treat because, because your dog picked it out. And it is usually a dog, by the way, because cats are really more roommates than pets. I mean, uh, to, be, to be fair, I, I, I have actually seen somebody walk a cat on a leash. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but the level of passion that you'll find from the folks in our stores when it comes to talking about pets and connecting with pet parents about those issues is, is huge. The R is about relationships, I'll talk about that. It's the, really the recognition that we've evolved from a mass marketing organization to more of a one-to-one -one engagement model driven uh, company. And finally, the T is transformation. To be able to make all those changes, what is it that we have to do on the back end, whether it be about talent or infrastructure or any of the resources that we're deploying to be able to support those changes in how we run our business. So let's talk about personalization for a second certainly the, the theme of this conference. This is what kind of every retailer has looked like, right? Put out an ad, this is what's important. Customer, I'm telling you this is what's important, go look at it. Right now it's about flea and tick. And you know, that's still, that's still a big part of how we tell stories. Um, but we're fortunate to have customers that are highly engaged in what they do. They talk to each other about their pets, they show up and they ask us questions. Uh, and, and we felt like there was a better way for us to be able to connect with them to deliver the kind of information uh, to them that they need and to be the sort of stewards for their purchases that they were looking for. And so we launched in September a new loyalty program called Treats, right? By the way, if you're at PetSmart, like everything has an animal name, uh, just to be clear. Uh, there's a paw report, there's uh, treats, there, I mean, it's all, all the acronyms relate back to some animal uh, or a code name. So uh, you, need, you need like a cheat sheet to figure it out, but Treats, Pretty straightforward. It's, it's not terribly complicated. It really is a traditional loyalty program where we've built the kind of back end to be able to tailor uh, what we give to a customer based on what we know about not just them as customers, but what pets they have. So as you log on, you've got the opportunity to complete your pet profile, all right? This is an example of what it looks like. Do I have a dog, a female? Etc. As you get in, you can see some of the specific choices. So now, I have the ability to talk to you as a customer, but recognize the variety of pets that you have and be able to tailor those choices to you. It also enables us to build a more cohesive ecosystem where we're better serving their needs, particularly on the services side. By having the back end scheduling mechanism and intelligence to know, all right, Kathy shows up. Kathy, do you have a pet, by the way? What, 
What? We had dogs. Dogs? A gecko, all right. We, I know we're, we'll get you a gecko. We can, we, we can take care of the gecko. Um, so, so when Kathy shows up with her dog, if we know, we know that dog by name, we know that relationship that we have had, whether it's the first time that this dog has shown up to be groomed, whether it's the 10th time, we know that on average it takes 42 minutes to provide that service. Why is that important? Well, on average, it takes about an hour and a half to groom a dog. So we would before think about hour and a half increments. If Kathy really wanted her dog groomed this afternoon because there was something going on this weekend and all we had was an hour of time available, we wouldn't have offered her that slot if we're thinking about everything in increments of an hour and a half, right? But if we know Gosh, I've, I've seen this pet 15 times. I, I, you know, I know who the groomer is. I know, you know what, what this looks like, and we can deliver that service and meet her needs so that she doesn't have to go another week. We can take care of the pet. That's a really big deal, right? It makes, it's, it's part of what we're responsible for in terms of how we can drive that relationship with our customers better. And, oh, by the way, you're earning points, you're earning dollars on every purchase so that you can deploy them back in a way that's most valuable to you. If you decide that you want to use it to treat your pet, great. If you decide you want it because you want to do an add-on service, you want to apply those dollars to an add-on service, if you want to bank them, if you want to give them away. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to put that power back in the hands of our customers so that they can ultimately drive the best decisions. We also have the ability to offer increasing value based off of the behavior that they show. All of it is being driven on the back end between um, you know, advanced algorithms that are learning how you purchase as a customer, all you know, fairly common practices within retail today, but then proactive knowledge that's being driven by our team to say, hey, how do we go in and do something that may be a little bit different? Last week, for example, in our salons, we had uh, lab day. All right, we invite uh, customers with labs to come in on that day, and I think on, on that particular day, we had somewhere in the neighborhood, Greg, was it 12,000, give or take? 12,000 labs in our stores. Kind of a weird day, right? I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I, I hope nobody's afraid of labs. Uh, you know, the, um, but those are the kinds of things that really drive interest and engagement for our customers. Um, when you go in to book a grooming appointment, you can see, here's a service. This is one of the coolest parts of it. You're not just picking a time and a service, but look all the way to the right. If you can make that out, about 38% of our team, team members or associates work in our salons. And in particular there, your relationship is, is probably more with that individual than it is even with PetSmart, right? Uh, that individual carries an awful lot of impact on our brand, and so part of how we've built our uh, engagement model is not just with us as a company, but we want you to be able to choose Paige if Paige is who you like to groom your pet, right? Being it, you know, that's important to you as a customer. It's also important to Paige as it relates to maintaining the relationships with her customers and her abilities to earn. People are a secret weapon. You know, I, we talked about some of the numbers. Uh, I'll give you a story that'll, that'll tell you, uh, give you some sense of, of the passion uh, of our team. So we talked about reptiles. First store that I visited for the company uh, was in Canada. Uh, I, I walk in, I actually hadn't started yet. I walk into the store and a guy is, he is talking about snakes and he is super, super passionate about snakes. Like maybe even a little more passionate than he should be. Uh, I mean, everybody, and so, I, I, but it's awesome, and you can watch like moms and kids and everybody, they're, they're, they're like engaged with, with this guy. And his name's Matt. I said, so Matt, what, you know, you're, you're really into to reptiles. I said, is it, is it all reptiles or just snakes? He said, oh, oh, snakes are, snakes, actually his exact words were, snakes are my jam. And I'm like, all right, well, great. <laughs> it's good for you. Uh, so I said, I said, oh, so you, you have snakes? He said, absolutely. I said, cool, how many, snakes? I said, how many snakes do you have? He goes, well, it's between 54 and 63. 
And I said, so you're telling me you're single? All right. I, <laughs> and he said, well, he said, well, I'm engaged. How'd you know I was single? I said, well, he goes, my, my, my fiance likes snakes too. I said, yes, but if you, she was your wife, it would not be a range. You would know exactly how many snakes you have. Like that, it would not, it would be 57. You'd give me a specific number. Our people are super passionate and really do care. As a matter of fact, sometimes we probably spend more time working on how to help them engage as well with people as they do with the pets that walk in our door. But here's a little bit of a makeup. Here's some examples of stories. This is uh, Jack. Uh, Jack uh, was uh, in, uh, I think, Wilmington, North Carolina, if I remember right. Uh, uh, did not, uh, had uh, terminal illness, was not gonna make it until Christmas, and, and his family had posted on social media this bucket list of things that they wanted to do, but they were hopeful they would get to experience one more Christmas with Jack, and they weren't sure they were gonna get to do it. Um, so what we did is we brought Santa in early and uh, ended up having Christmas in the store. Our team members pulled this together and ended up being this great local story that got picked up and ABC and NBC and others talked about it. Uh, but this, this is an example of a team of people deciding that they wanted to make a difference because they care about Jack and they care about his family. Uh, another example of, of Jackson. I, I'm just in the Jays. I mean, we got more. Uh, this, this is actually pretty cool. So uh, Jackson, uh, we, we had a team member, I think it was Texas, I wrote it down. Yeah, it was Lake Worth, Texas. Uh, an associate uh, heard about this, uh, this dog who loved this green toy. Like, this person couldn't find it, they were upset about it, they were looking for it everywhere. So, so this associate in Lake Worth, Texas, by the way, uh, Jackson was in Bowling Green, Kentucky, so it's not like this was even a customer, was just moved by it and started calling all of our stores and rounding up all of these green toys and sent them uh, to Jackson, like, and, you know, just on her own. I mean, this was her, you know, motivation. Uh, but, you know, the Today Show picked it up. I mean, th these are the kinds of people that I'm blessed to be able to work with uh, each and every day, and that's the kind of passion that helps separate uh, what we do and makes it a great place to be. Um, there's all kinds of local events in our stores. We'll have an event uh, on average uh, every two weeks, uh, and so if you're ever you know, having a rough Saturday, uh, go two in a row, and you're likely to see lots of dogs walking around uh, our stores, uh, whether it's taking pictures with the Easter Bunny in a couple of weeks, or trying samples, really tailoring sample events to allow animals to taste and try uh, new products. Those are the kinds of things that really uh, motivate our customers and create the kind of community within our stores that help separate and, and drive relevance for PetSmart. The other thing that I'm probably uh, most proud of is we don't just serve people well in this space. We are the largest benefactor uh, for animal welfare in the United States. Um, PetSmart Charities is a separate entity, uh, but uh, all of the revenue comes from uh, PetSmart and specifically from our customers. Uh, over 90 cents of every dollar makes it directly uh, to an animal welfare organization in examples like this. Uh, we support therapy animals in 10 local children's hospitals. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, we also give a lot of emergency funding uh, whether it's wildfires in California, Hurricane Harvey, which I had a chance to see up close and personal. PetSmart is the person who shows up to make sure that those animals that are displaced find homes or receive the care that they need. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary. In those 25 years, we've given $413 million to help pets and people that need it most. And probably the thing that people know us most for is adoptions, and through the work that we've done, partnering with over 4,000 local shelters, we've actually rescued over eight and a half million animals. That's part of, you know, and, and when, when you do that, and when your team has the opportunity to stand up and say that you're being a part of that, that idea that, that you know, doing well by doing good is, is the reality that you live each and every day is something that we're excited and, and feel very fortunate to, to be a part of. Um, we do give back at a local level. You can see you know, some of the examples of what we do here locally. Uh, that's something that we've actually reinvested in as a company. Um, and we've also 
partnered with institutions like this to be able to make sure that the pipeline of talent is something that we continue to bring into the company. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, we've got two 2018 interns that are uh, actually coming back and then another five uh, that will be here this year. So uh, as, you, as you look, I would encourage you to, to seek them out and ask questions about what it's like to be a part of our company, what we do well, what we don't do well, because there's plenty of things that we're still working on getting better. Uh, that's part of what uh, we look for uh, to continue to grow. Um, you know, we've been fortunate uh, to be able to add a lot of talented people from the University of Arizona. You can see an example of, of some of the Wildcats. And this, this feels sort of shameless. This feels like the rock and roller who's like, yeah, Cleveland's my favorite town. You know, I mean, they're, um, but you know what? It's not that. Actually, um, the reason I did this is something different. You know, Mike mentioned it. We've got 75 people here. Um, they're all great people. Um, but one of the things I feel really strongly about is when you, when you have the chance to work with talented people, um, it, you know, being able to be back on their turf and recognize those folks who have come from here and are making a big difference in writing our story is something that I'm proud to do because they earn it. They are, they are, uh, we are blessed to have some really talented people. These just happen to be some of the examples that have come from this institution. They're part of a much bigger team that uh, we feel uh, grateful and, and thankful uh, for each and every day. Um, we do actually, let me go back because uh, I, I've talked a little bit about what it's like to work there. I want to save time for questions, but I think we got a video that shows a little bit of a sense of, of what PetSmart's all about. So let's roll that and then we'll be ready for questions. At PetSmart, we love pets. We love the way they brighten our days, inspire us to live fully, and create connections to the world around us. That love drives every decision we make, from the products we sell, to the services we offer in our stores, to the type of work experience we create for our associates. Across our offices, distribution centers, and more than 1,600 stores, we value every opportunity to serve as the trusted partner to pet parents and pets in every moment of their lives. Our love of pets also influences the ways we choose to give back to the community. We envision a world in which every pet has a lifelong loving home. In partnership with PetSmart Charities, we open our stores to over 3,500 animal welfare organizations who've saved the lives of over 8.5 million homeless pets through our in-store adoption program. As a Phoenix-based company, we're proud to support organizations that enrich lives through arts and culture and unite our community. As a business, we're firmly committed to creating a company, a community, and a world where everyone belongs and can live out loud with authenticity. We are PetSmart, 55,000 associates united together in our passion for pets, people, and unconditional love. All right, so unless I'm getting the hook, uh, I, I'm happy to take questions. We have a question over here. Okay. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I'm a professor at the U of A. But this is more of a personal question. Sure. Um, my dog is a Weimaraner, and his name is Hudson. Um, and he has, um, he's, he's a prince of a pup. And so we do buy from PetSmart, but um, only specialty items because I am one of those pet parents that will make his food, uh -huh. right? So I make uh, yams for him. And, uh, and then he also had a traumatic experience, and I'm not too sure if it was um, with Groomy, with your store, or maybe somebody else, but this happened maybe five years ago. So I'm wondering, what are you doing to go after the market that you don't have, like, from someone like me or someone like my daughter who makes their own dog food and someone who doesn't use the grooming service because, I don't know, maybe there's a psychological need there for, for Hudson. I'm wondering if there's anything that you're doing regarding that and going after that market share. Sure, no, it's a great question. So uh, this year, um, let me take it in two parts. When we look at uh, what we offer in terms of food in particular, I'll, I'll stay with kind of dog and cat more specifically because it's the biggest part of, of our customer base. 
Um, we feel really strongly about the idea of preserving choice for people across the full spectrum. So if you're a value customer, all the way up to you know, the highest end, freshest ingredients, um, everyone makes those choices for a reason. And, and we feel like there's an honor in each of those choices. And we also recognize that no matter where you are, uh, as Americans, we are an er society. People really don't want to be healthy, they want to be healthier. Doesn't matter how, you know, where they sit, right? We always want some version of better. And so uh, we're really trying to, to change the way we merchandise our stores to better deliver against that idea. Um, we'll spend, uh, you know, uh, a lot of money this year uh, actually uh, resetting and relaying all of our stores, uh, really deprioritizing uh, some traditional brands. I won't, I won't name them just because it, I don't want to send the wrong signal, but really giving space uh, to uh, new growing categories uh, that are, I guess, serving some of those needs. Now, look, there, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to sell fresh produce in our stores. That's, that's not the business that we're in. But you know, more space dedicated, refrigerated, frozen, you know, higher ingredient, uh, higher protein contents. And where we don't have partners who can deliver that, we're actually putting the money into it uh, and developing it ourselves. Uh, almost $2 billion worth of what we sell is only found at PetSmart. It's our own proprietary brands. And, and whether it's uh, specific nutritional needs or uh, you know, solving issues like urinary tract uh, health deficiencies, you know, things that the industry hasn't caught up to, uh, we're leading to be able to deliver against that. The same is true for services. Uh, we're, we're investing in our space so that we can provide, you know, continue to provide not only the highest level of care, but also look at how do we really enrich that experience up to and including do we start to perform it outside of our four walls. So it's, it's very much a part of where we're making investments moving forward. Uh, another question. Yes. Um, hi, JK. Um, hi. You have a really great history in retail and listening to the voice of the shopper, but in this case, you have a lot of pets, and how are you listening to like the voice of the pets? Like, How do they weigh in on products or services um, versus their parents? You know, um, it's, uh, it's probably the hardest thing. I mean, it's the biggest point of stress for our customers, right? Our, our pets can't tell us what they want. Um, I don't lose sight of the fact that that's one of the points of value of having between 1,000 to 1,200 pets in our office, right? I mean, the, the ability uh, to apply, you know, some science and, you know, some uh, sort of art to how do we make those choices, how are we uh, testing and trying what it is that we bring forward to customers. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a big part of why that level of, of partnership with you know, with our own employees and associates that are pet parents is such a big part of what we do. There is a fair amount of science around flavor. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is uh, what you have to learn is it's, it's different. It's scent more so than it is actual flavor. So it, while the, the trends are the same as you would find in human food, for example, um, the, the registry of it within the animal uh, is a different set of scientific measurements. But you, you can actually apply science to it and, and get to a quantitative view of what you're delivering, uh, there's, there's no substitute for this feels better or that feels better. And that's where having lots of animals in our office each and every day and even more uh, at home is, is really critical. Um, we do have live feedback loops with our customers um, so that, I mean, literally I get a report every day, not just about you know our, our customer experience at a checkout, but products, services, so that we're we're listening real time to a larger percent of our, our customers than, than people would probably think. Beauty of technology today. Yes, sir. Um, so many businesses like Best Buy or Office Depot have sort of gravitated more towards services recently, um, you know, as a way to differentiate themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you look at your business as a percentage of, you know, total revenue, how do you see services growing over time? Uh, look, I, I mean, it's funny. I, I think given the kind of the growth curve that we're on, um, depending on the choices we make, we have a unique opportunity. If you think about e-commerce, traditional merchandise, and services, you know, in, in those buckets, um, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of our revenue will be split between e-commerce and traditional brick and mortar merchandise. Uh, and about 20% of our revenue will be services-based. And if you look at that split of 
of brick and mortar and e-commerce, I actually think more than not, it'll probably be closer to 50-50. Uh, both are growing, but the growth of e-commerce is, is real in that space, particularly for those things that are regimen-based. And so uh, it'll change how we assort our stores, uh, but it's why the growth of services now, you know, we've been in the service space for a long time, so it's, it's a bigger, we're starting with a head start um, uh, there, but it, it, you know, it, it will be the highest growth business that we have this year, and, and based on how we're making investments in it, I think it'll continue to be. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.